Hey, Mark. Hey, Mark. hey David. Great How to you? have you. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen if that's okay. Go right, for it. Oh, that's not I want this one. Here we go. Great. We've got a couple of slides from you. Uh, yeah, I've got a different slide deck this time, a little bit, just slightly modified. Okay, cool. We've got a couple of people starting into the room. Welcome uh, everyone who's joining us for the round table. We'll get started in a few minutes. So you'll, you'll, you want to walk us through a, a bit of a presentation, then we'll do some uh, Q&A? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's get started, David. Uh, hey, welcome everyone. My name's Mark Boyd. Uh, I use the pronouns he and him, and I'll be your moderator for this session, uh, for this round table. And we've got David from No Name Security. Congratulations, David. I um, noticed that there's some new funding that No, uh, no Name's just uh, gotten. Yeah. yeah, thanks, Mark. That was uh, big news today in that we announced uh, a B round of venture capital for no name uh, in the amount of $60 million. So uh, in just uh, seven months, we have uh, raised $85 million uh, to build no name into the world-class company that we expected. So wow, very kudos. excited. It's a good sign of, pro of the technology you've got behind the team, as well as the need, you know, so, yeah. so it's really, uh, congratulations to you all. So then you've got a bit of a presentation you want to walk us through. Do you want to let us know what your um, role at um, No Name is? Then walk us through the presentation and then we'll jump into some Q&A. We've got a couple of questions people have asked already when they were booking in for this um, round table and then we'll open it up to the audience as well. Anyone in the audience, feel free to jump in and um, post a question as we go through. But I'll, for now, I'll let you take it away, David. Yeah, you bet. Thank you. I appreciate that, Mark. And uh, yeah, so just have a few slides uh, to go through. Again, I'm David Thomason. I'm the uh, Worldwide Director for Solution Architects uh, at No Name, and I've been doing cybersecurity work for, well, since 1986. So <laughs> a long time when I was writing uh, code for the United States Air Force Intelligence Community uh, to do security for their uh, information systems. So let's, uh, let's go through and talk about why uh, API security doesn't have to be hard, uh, you know, but 
the, you know, some of the questions are why now, right? Everybody wants to know what the problem is. Why is there a problem today? And why wasn't it a problem before? Well, I think today we see more and more that APIs are mission critical, uh, especially during COVID. We saw with all of the uh, work from home efforts, API development really uh, accelerated even faster than it had in the past. And so as a result, we've seen, you know, cloud increase the, the use of APIs, uh, APIs being used for everything in mobile apps and web apps and server to server communications and, you know, outbound communications with your SaaS applications like Salesforce and Twilio and all those kinds of things. Uh, and so APIs are absolutely mission critical. Uh, the challenge has been with APIs growing as fast as they have and the need from a business perspective for those APIs, that security and that development velocity uh, don't really get along very well. I, that we call it a conflict between security and development philosophy, or velocity, excuse me. <laughs> velocity being the fact that they are deploying these so fast that, that the security team can't keep up. They really don't being deployed out there and uh, I have asked many many times to different uh, customers CISOs security teams you know how many APIs do you have in your environment how many have you published yourself and how many are your users consuming and how many are you consuming from outbound sources and all those questions and the answer is almost always a shrug they really don't know what it is and so it seems like this is an overwhelming problem they can't even figure out what they've got uh, in the environment, and then the environment changes, <laughs> right? We're going from, you know, data centers to clouds to hybrid to multi-cloud, and then you've got multiple different uses of, of API gateways and web application firewalls, whether you're using Mule or Apogee or WSO2 or Tyke or any of the folks that are sponsoring this, this, uh, these presentations all great products and we support and absolutely recommend the use of those platforms in the environment. But at the end of the day, how do you get all of the information associated with your APIs into one place where you can then monitor the security of those APIs, manage the security of those APIs, remediate vulnerabilities and attacks on them and all those kinds of things. And what this has all led to is that of course today, APIs are the top attack vector. Uh, Gartner said it was going to be 2022. Uh, I talked to them not too long ago. They told me we got it wrong. I was a little shocked and thought, uh-oh, I've been, you know, duped into <laughs> doing something. And they said, no, no, we're, you got it backwards. It's not that it's going to be later. It's sooner. It already has happened that APIs are the top of tech vector. And just in case you were wondering, uh, you know, how many companies have been attacked or been compromised recently or, or have had API vulnerabilities demonstrated in their environment, if you will, just take a look at these. And I can't even keep track of all of the API or all the companies that have had APIs uh, compromised. Even this week, uh, we saw that LinkedIn had the huge compromise of over 700 million APIs. Uh, so this challenge just continues to grow and grow and grow. So how do we make it better? That's what I want to talk about today. Well, the first thing we do is we build a strategy around it. Now, I have heard shift left used as a strategy. And the challenge with shift left is that there's an implication that you can ignore right if you do the shift left. And so it seems like uh, a lot of organizations spend a lot of effort into shifting left. And don't get me wrong, I think shifting left is absolutely important and strategic and very valuable you know if they didn't shift left with automobiles we'd be wrapping mattresses on the outside of our car to protect us instead of having airbags on the inside right there, we left we want to build that technology into uh, the apis we want to train our teams to develop and deliver you know more secure code but at the end of the day you also have to monitor and watch those apis and remediate things that happen, well, because humans make mistakes. And it's just, it's just the way it is. And it doesn't matter whether it's you know, vulnerabilities in uh, an operating system that have to be monitored after you've already done, uh, used the CIS to build an operating system that's secure. We wanna do the same thing with APIs. We need to build in the security up front, 
but then monitor and manage that security on the back end. And I'm gonna take just a pause here, just a second and say, hey, Mark, have we got any questions yet that we need to uh, uh, address at this point? No, but a good point as far as anyone in the audience, please, um, if you've got an API security question, we've got a couple that we've already been uh, asked from the audience in their uh, in their in their sign up for the for this roundtable. Um, but any that are uh, top of mind for the audience, please uh, jump into the chat now. Yeah, thank you very much. So, yeah, if you have any questions, please please drop them in the chat. So. Uh, we have developed an API security strategy that I think is very holistic in the sense that it covers the entire software development life cycle. So uh, we call it DART and we call it DART because it's easy to remember and it really hits on the four pillars of what we call the, the security strategy. Uh, the first being discover. If you don't know what's in your environment and you, you, you haven't figured out what how many APIs you have, what those APIs look like, what sensitive data they carry, all those kinds of things. You really are, are blind to what is being exposed. And as a security professional, that is a challenge. That is a big problem. We can't be blind to the things that we're required to protect. And so as a result, you've got to discover all of them, not just the API gateways, but also those legacy APIs that have been around since before the API gateways or before the web application firewall or before we deployed to the cloud. So all of those APIs are important because they transmit corporate data that can be very sensitive uh, and, and very valuable to the organization. The, the second pillar is to analyze. And in the analyze stage, what we wanna do is we wanna look at not only the traffic of the APIs so that we see how the API is being deployed in the environment, not how it was designed, not how it was developed, uh, and not even how it's been documented, but actually how it's being operated in, in the environment through the traffic that we see around that API. So we can tell which data types uh, are in the schema, uh, how it's authenticated, uh, whether it's routed through the API or not, or through the API gateway. All of that information is very important to analyze. And then the third pillar is to remediate. One of the first things you want to do after you've done some discovery and analysis is to remediate the known issues associated with the attack surface of those APIs. So if you have APIs that are lacking authentication for whatever reason, you add the authentication. If they're not routed through the API gateway, you would move them back through and route them back through the API gateway or eliminate the alternate route that we've discovered which might be just a public IP address on an EC2 instance, for example, that shouldn't be there. Uh, and then finally, regardless of when you're in your CI CD pipeline or what stage of your software development lifecycle you're in, we should be testing APIs. So we should be testing them during design, testing them during development, testing them in pre-prod and in staging, and even in post-production, we can test APIs and make sure that they're pro providing the information and not exposing our APIs more than they should be uh, in the environment. So got a few minutes left. I want to talk about how we do this uh, easily. Well, the first thing is we have to look at everything holistically. So when you're at the cloud environment, for example, we need to look at all of the traffic in the environment. We need to be able to monitor those APIs, whether we're getting the, the information from an API gateway or whether we're getting it from an EC2 instance or the back end of a load balancer. Uh, all of those places are great places to gather information about uh, APIs. We want to look at the perimeter, if you will, and I, I don't like the word perimeter very much anymore because it's so porous, <laughs> but we need to look at all of the devices that quite honestly are are managing and maintaining or transmitting or possibly transmitting APIs and then discover all of those APIs. And, and you know, uh, you know, here's a, a blatant pitch for no name. We do this without agents. We do this without, uh, w without putting in any kind of sidecars. Uh, we deploy as we actually just connect if, to your cloud environment and can gather all of that information to tell you very, very quickly what all your APIs all are and what kind of data that they're transmitting, where they're going in the environment and all those kinds of things. In the data center, 
We do similar things. We can connect to the firewall and get a decrypted channel off of the firewall to see that information. We can connect to something like an A5 or an A10 uh, load balancer where we can also get the decrypted uh, mirrors uh, off of that, uh, off of those systems. And then be able to look at all of the data to see all of the APIs, decode that traffic and tell you exactly how they're being deployed uh, in the environment. So. We have talked to organization after organization uh, and, and done tons of, uh, and, and all of our customers and, and proof of concept tests show that about 30 to 40% of all APIs aren't going through an API gateway or a web application firewall. And unfortunately, and I don't know, hey, uh, Mark, does my mouse show up on this screen by any chance? Yep. It does. Great, excellent, thank you. Uh, so let me just give a quick example of what we see frequently uh, in other organizations' environments. And because their cloud is, is growing so fast, what we see is that they have developed APIs that are supposed to be server to server. So you've got, for example, this virtual machine that's communicating to this virtual machine with an API and back and forth. Uh, and as this uh, cloud environment grows, excuse my, uh, my mouse interacting. Uh, as this cloud environment grows and the customer stands up another EC2 instance and they stand up another load balancer, all of a sudden there's a route to this API that's managed by this particular uh, virtual machine that can reach the internet through the load balancer. And it may be also routed through the API gateway, but the fact that you can go around the API gateway and get to that same API means Longer protected by rate limiting. It's no longer protected by the authentication mechanisms that are being managed by the API gateway. There are so many things that that API gateway provides from a security perspective that are now being completely bypassed by this alternate route to the API. And it happens over and over and over. A automated way to identify all of those routes, you are left with a manual uh, review of your environment to make sure that those don't happen. Very, very difficult, takes a lot of expertise to be able to identify those kinds of things. And so this is one of the ways where we help make uh, the discovery of APIs extremely easy, uh, may absolutely simplify this. And then from a data governance perspective, we can take, for example, APIs that have credit card information in them and automatically tag them with a piece or if they've got uh, prescription information, we can tag them with PII or PHI uh, tags so that you can now follow the data within the environment and see where your PCI, PHI, PII data is traveling, how it's accessible, how it's it, making sure that it has the, the uh, necessary uh, protections around it that it deserves. Fantastic. So, well, before we continue with the analyze out of the um, DART model that you're talking through, Rez has asked from the audience, would you say Open Policy Agent is a good tool to use for fine-grained access to APIs? And if not, would there be a better practice in industry today? Where would that fit in on, the, on your DART model, for starters? That, that's a really good question. Uh, I need you to describe what Open Policy Agent is to me. I'm not familiar yeah, with right. that. Was, I'm a security guy, not an agent. Okay, cool. Yeah, no, I wasn't sure. Reza, if you've got time, could you um uh, explain? I presume that was a technical tool uh, term that um David will be familiar with. If it's a specific tool, um, uh, then we're not familiar with it. But if it's if it's talking about um the something around um access permission control, um, then uh, perhaps let us know and we'll um, try to answer your question. David, um, do you want to continue with walking us through Analyze? Although I, also in your model, though, where does access permission controls as a sort of security technique, where does that sit? You know, the whole zero trust, all of, all of that sort of thing. So the way that we operate uh, in the environment is out of, completely out of band. So only the customer that only the customers users that they want to have access to the data that we uh, consume in order to identify all of their APIs. It's only available to those that have access uh, to our platform. And even within our platform, we have role based access controls. So particular business units can be assigned to particular APIs. They wouldn't, for example, the 
the marketing team wouldn't have access to the HR APIs, uh, as an example. Easy, easy to set up, easy, easy to organize within the environment. And so then when you're doing the, that discovery um, uh, of discovery phase, are you identifying those access permission controls that go with the APIs that you're discovering that might not have been in their inventory and all of that sort of thing as well? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, let me let me go to analyze, analyzing because go. I yeah. think that there's right. this good, right. and just good transition and we didn't even right. practice, Mark. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Riz has also asked, he's tried to explain, he said that um, it's a rule engine for fine-grained authorization, so it might not be relevant here. But actually, you're going to get onto this issue for under analyze. so I'll let yeah. you go. Yeah, so one of the things that we do is we look at uh, the entire environment. So it's not just the traffic that we analyze, but it's also the the uh, all of the components that are responsible for managing APIs. Uh, whether it's an API gateway, a web application firewall, a load balancer, uh, even the, the virtual machine or EC2 instance that, that the uh, API resides on, a Lambda function, uh, if you will, all of those get analyzed uh, to see how they are configured within the environment. So uh, related to how uh, authorization takes place, we look very closely at the authentication, we validate the authentication, uh, authorization, if you're looking for things like broken object level authorization issues and those kinds of things, we identify those by modeling the behavior of the APIs themselves. And because every API gets a model, we can be very specific in the way that we model those APIs. And that specificity keeps us from having a number of false positives. It also lets us be very detailed in the way that we describe an API is being misused. So for example, if the user ID in the body of the API is supposed to match uh, the, the user ID in the header of the API and there's a pro proper authorization and bearer token and all those kinds of things uh, associated with it, we'll tell you if for whatever reason those two don't match because every it, it should match. They're hitting a button on their, um, they're hitting a button on their web app or their mobile app that, that automatically fills that in. And when it doesn't match, it means they're using something like Postman or Burp Suite or some other testing tool that allows them to you know, substitute those, those values. And we'll identify those kinds of uh, anomalous activities very quickly. But by looking at the misconfigurations, we can tell you that there's an API with no rate limit or an API that, excuse me, uh, that there's an API that, like I said before, is in, you know accidentally open to the internet. They've put a public IP on something that shouldn't have it. Or there's an API that, that without authentication. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to CISOs and said, you know, the situation is that there's a, an, uh, a bug in an API and the developer, it goes out and in order to be able to test the API quickly, he turns off the authentication, he finds the bug, he fixes the bug, he pushes out the master code and forgets to turn the authentication back on. Has that ever happened to you? And they all go, yes, two weeks ago, right? It, it happens all the time. And so these are the kinds of things that we'll identify very quickly. Or an API that you know normally doesn't provide any sensitive information, all of a sudden starts dumping loads of sensitive information. That would be a big deal. And all of a sudden we'll identify those kinds of things. But that flips us from the configurations over to the anomalies. And those, that's where we get into behavioral analysis. That's where we get into individual API uh, modeling of the APIs, and we can identify uh, those behavior issues associated with it. So, hey, give me a time check, Mark. I didn't see a clock on our uh, We've got five table, here. table here. We've got five minutes. Thanks. Um, so let's keep working through the uh, the R and the T. Um, but anyone in the audience, jump in with some questions in our chat. Um, while well, we've got David's time. So, yeah, I, I was thinking with the um, analyze and the turning off authentication, everyone just uh, giving people uh, super admin user access. <laughs> that happens it, quite it a happens bit. It happens a lot, absolutely a lot. And then we see, you know, tokens that don't have timeouts on them. You know, they don't refresh at all. They don't, they don't ever transition those tokens out. Uh, there's there's so many issues around APIs uh, or even APIs that have authentication in place, but then don't check the authentication. They put it in place, but then on the back end, they don't validate it. 
and you can literally drop in fake data into the validation and it just works. And it's like, wow, we see this kind of thing all the time. So remediate uh, is the third pillar in the DART API security strategy. And this is your ability, ability to make changes that positively impact. And I, again, I love shift left. And from my perspective, shift left in this perspective means that before there's an attack, we have the opportunity to remediate issues that are made either by human error or machine error, or however they're produced, we have the opportunity to go in and, and reduce that, uh, uh, that attack surface, if you will. So as an example, we've seen organizations that used a wildcard SSL certificate in every virtual machine. Not a best practice, but we'll identify that and we'll notify them. And then if they've got a secure, a strong security team, they'll start making the changes to drop, you know, to move all of those, you know, uh, wildcards out and use subdomain certificates and host certificates in order to be able to authenticate with the right certificate and not having one certificate that could expose all of their data if it was uh, if the one was compromised. Uh, things like again uh, uh, being able to take an API that is not routed through uh, an API gateway and moving it into the API gateway. That's a remediation. Being able to just generate a service net, a Jira, a Trello, uh, a webhooks uh, event in order to make sure uh, that those things get remediated or get reported back to the team that developed that particular API. All of those are important remediation steps that needed to be take, taken. Also integration with just about anything, like I, I, one of my favorites is integration with security orchestration, automation and response. I know this is an API and not a security uh, event, so you might not be familiar with SOAR, but SOAR, uh, Security Orchestration Automation and Response, is the ability to orchestrate in the sense that you can manually or semi-automatically approve for different automations to be executed until a time where you feel like you're confident that, okay, I can do this every single time that this incident occurs. In your security teams, this means that you can do everything from change a policy on a web application firewall, block an IP address on a, on a, on a next generation firewall, uh, or even revoke a credential, uh, if you will, from your authentication system. Uh, all of those kinds of things are possible and you can run through those step by step and make sure that it works perfectly and that you're not blocking anything that is actually essential data or essential operations in the environment. And then finally, I want to hit just a minute on test. Uh, to be able to test in pre-production, uh, during deployment, and after deployment, I think is absolutely essential. Uh, we want to be able to show you before you deploy that uh, API, what are the vulnerabilities associated with it? Is it susceptible to BOLA? Is it susceptible to an authentication or credential uh, stuffing attack? Uh, is there a uh, a rate limit that's correct on this particular API. Can somebody who normally gets one record at a time submit a uh, request and get 500 records back? All of those kinds of things are are the types of uh, you know tests that we want to be able to do, and then we want to be able to do those same kinds of tests in a post production or in the production environment without interrupting the actual business. And we know how to do that. We've got the built, we've got the processes built in to be able to do that. And it's all included in the no name platform. Uh, and so I want to, uh, just tell you right off the, at the end, you know, if you have more information or we want more information from us, if you haven't got your questions answered here, uh, come see us at no name security, request a demo. Uh, we'd love to show you how we can make API security easy for you. Thanks, David. Do you want to post your um, email or way to contact? Apart from just the website, yeah, anyone in the audience wants to get in touch, um, so post your email in the chat window. Um, any last question? Thanks. Any last questions for people? The um, idea of showing the um, discover, analyze, remediate test um, uh, model as well and walking us through the components of that. Uh, I think it gives for anyone from API security them a model that they, I mean, whether they use no name security or not, it gives them a really clear approach to how to ensure their security.
security is up to standard. So a lot of great points we talked through today. So thanks for your time. Hey, thank you very much, Mark. And I do have another uh, work, work table, uh, what do we call this, uh, workshop round table uh, tomorrow. And I've also got a uh, another uh, workshop tomorrow. I got two workshops tomorrow, I think. Okay, great. So let's. So anyone in the audience wanting to continue the conversation, uh, come and join us for those. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Thanks, David. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye bye.